We're here in Washington, D.C. with Russ Johnson, Esri's uh, Global Director for Emergency Response. Uh, how are you doing today, Russ? I'm great, thanks. Can you tell folks a little bit about your background and what brought you to this position? Well, my previous background, I spent 30 years as a first responder, primarily in Southern California. Um, I, the last 10 years of my career, I was fortunate enough to work with the uh, Federal Emergency Management Incident Command System Operations, where I became an incident commander of one of the 18 national teams uh, responding to complex emergencies in the U.S. and worldwide. Um, what I discovered in that capacity or that role was often we would be sent to places that we had never been before, and the devastation could be you know, significant. I discovered GIS technology would help us not only understand what the landscape existed of before the event, but where uh, people who might be in need of immediate search and rescue, critical infrastructure for the continuity of government operations might be located. And we could deploy our resources and be more effective. Uh, time is everything in emergency response and we could deploy the right place at the right time in, in a much more optimized way. That's how I came into the world of GIS. Um, beyond that, I decided to go to work for Esri and help Esri build a practice for public safety to improve upon GIS technology's ability to support a public safety mission. So in the context of that work, uh, you spent uh, more than three decades working uh, in federal emergency management, uh, specifically wildfires in South California. And uh, in, then since you've left there, you've uh, been adapting um, technology to meet the missions of people uh, who serve in similar positions. Uh, what's the context of how technology has changed in the past couple of years that allows you to do that? Yeah, I, I did spend 30 years largely in the wildfire business, mm -hmm. although in the last 10 years it was responding to emergencies of all types. Okay. Um, so in the last five years, to your question, uh, when I first entered into the GIS uh, domain, it was largely a GIS technology world, professional geographers, GIS technicians. In the last five years, the technologies evolved to where it can be configured, where it's easy to use, and it can be deployed in mission critical uh, environments. Not by GIS technicians, but by normal operators. Fitting the way they do their work, how they do their work. Uh, a first responder in a fire engine, for example, while responding, may be able to touch a computer screen twice and learn exactly where the incident location is what the floor plan of the facility that they're driving to looks like, where the search and rescue priorities might be, um, where electrical shutoffs might be. So these are all capabilities that improve upon the effectiveness and the safety, not only of first responders, but during large-scale emergencies where it's more complex. Um, now, one of the large-scale emergencies uh, we're seeing right now is in Australia. Um, the flooding there continues to go on. I uh, even saw a couple news reports, uh, uh, aside from the bedraggled kangaroos, that uh, showed a bull shark or two uh, going down the street. Of, and um, th the story there uh, is, is evolving in terms of the use of technology by citizens, first responders, uh, government. Um, what was uh, Esri's role there, and, and how does it play into uh, Ushahidi, this uh, crowd mapping uh, application we've heard a lot about? So, I'll try to adequately respond to your question, and multi-pronged, but um, the, the whole flooding environment is impacting a lot of population, a lot of natural resources, and a lot of critical infrastructure. So once again, we can use GIS to determine exactly where the priorities for returning the community back to some sense of normality, where rescue issues and priorities exist. That's, that's the traditional use of GIS. We also have uh, dispatched some of our personnel to help with the damage assessment so that they can begin to understand where the damage is most critical and how to recover uh, or recover more quickly. Uh, some of the mines being flooded, it's costing Australia somewhere in the vicinity of a billion dollars a day with all of the mineral output shut down. So it's not only critical for local citizens, but the economy. And, and long-term recovery is often uh, 
determined by how well you initially engage your actions, for which GIS can, can play an important role. Beyond that, uh, a recent phenomenon that um, we're really beginning to put our heads together to determine how can we utilize this new social media phenomena, crowdsourcing information. Um, every, every person now is potentially a sensor. And when we can take text messages or we can get tweets and we can geolocate those on the map and we can look at those in context, uh, tweets where somebody, their only way of communicating that they need rescue help or they need food or they need supplies may come from that type of, of device or may come through Yushahidi. When we map those, we can then begin to categorize those into what type of service or help. We can prioritize those based on the criticality. And then we can begin to look at those points of information and do density analysis against them to see if one area might be more uh, impacted than another, which helps first responders focus their efforts to do the greatest good in the shortest period of time. So um, we, during this event, experimented with that capability using Yushahidi, and we've had very good feedback, and it begins to add more context and takes a lot of information coming from a lot of places and makes it more actionable. So if I hear you correctly, then, you're mashing up uh, emergency social data in the form of tweets or other information uh, collected on Ushahidi's platform and then pulling it into the GIS system at Esri to uh, allow first responders to have better situational awareness uh, and then to understand where they need to move resources um, much more quickly or respond. Is that correct? Yeah, well said. Good question. Um, yeah, so we're taking the information from Yushahidi. We're pulling that into a GIS environment, which allows us, one, to look at the, the, the location. But due to the power or the, the enabling analytic capability of GIS, we're able to do some rapid analysis to refine all of that information into actions based on priority and sense of urgency. Again, to your point, it might be somebody needs to be rescued. Their only form of communication has been text messaging. It may mean that somebody needs food, water, uh, shelter. We can begin to categorize those out, prioritize those, analyze those in GIS, and then respond to them more effectively. Is this kind of integration, uh, now that you've uh, piloted it in Australia, uh, going to be something that's available elsewhere in the world? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, ESRI and, and GIS is, uh, those platforms are prevalent throughout the world. And this is simply extending those capabilities for this purpose. Everything we build and learn it's our goal to support our users, to demonstrate what's possible, to assist them in being able to do this for themselves, and to continue to get feedback and refine tools and capabilities that can make it even more actionable. So the answer to your question is yes. Um, again, this is a relatively new phenomenon. Everybody's a sensor. Everybody's uh, potentially information that can help the overall situational awareness for government officials. And we're trying to assist our users in being able to act upon that data as quickly and as effectively as they can. Now, the concern that I hear from people in the emergency management and crisis response community, certainly in the military, other positions um, where they're entrusted with making decisions that have um, repercussions down the road in terms of uh, deployment of material or, or resources uh, that may be life-changing, depending upon what, where they are or they're not. There's concern about um, authentication of these, these sources of information. And uh, you described how pulling them into a map can allow some degree of additional um, certitude. Mm -hmm. um, how do you, as someone who's been in that role before, um, react to those kinds of critiques? How do you explain that this is, uh, that this is a useful thing to do? So yeah, it's an interesting question, and it's one that is pondered by a lot of folks. Certainly, hopefully, social media is not your only source of data. Um, you're going to be getting data, hopefully, from a lot of different sources. Uh, the social media data helps you validate, helps you discover if perhaps you've run a model, a 
let's say we have a, uh, like during the uh, oil spill, we were assisting NOAA and BP Oil run models of where the oil proliferation would be. Uh, we would put that model on the map. Decisions were made about where to boom, where to protect, based on that model. Well, then social media would be coming in that would show photographs of oil coming on the beach in an area that the model hadn't predicted. So you, you, you need to then look at that, and if it's repetitive, then you need to act on it and maybe refine your model. Um, it's not the only source of information, but it helps you validate and adjust. And to ignore that, I mean, when we have pictures coming in that show the beach and oil on it, it that's probably uh, reasonable to assume that uh, that happened. So again, there, there is no formula for how to use social media uh, totally effectively, and that's part of what we're trying to do is how do we take this unbounded information and begin to bound it a little bit, prioritize it, make it actionable to enhance what we already have in the way of situational awareness. In the case of Haiti, which was an earthquake where everybody expected that we would be in the dark with no calm, uh, social media was one of the only forms of information we had. So that's perhaps an opposite example, but it did give us decent information about where the devastation was strong, particularly when you would get social media information that was very similar from the same area from different sources. You have to believe that there's something there, and it gives you at least some information to begin to think about acting. So uh, it's really Haiti, which uh, happened a year ago now, as we sit here in uh, 2011, um, changed the conversation. Um, how do you expect that conversation to further change over the next year or two? And where do you expect this uh, combination of crisis data, uh, mapping citizens as sensors to evolve towards? You know, I, I, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful that we continue to discover effective ways not only to map and give context to social media, but we begin to understand how we can add analytic capability to it. Uh, in many cases in large emergencies, uh, the community is devastated. The road networks are gone. First responders are not going to be able to get to you. Oftentimes the first responders might be your neighbors that are in good shape that can come and help you. So, you know, much like Neighborhood Watch, maybe neighborhood groups can form around this technology to support one another. That information can be tiered up to your public safety first responders, and priorities can be established for helicopter intrusion or getting the road network back into place. I'm not sure what it's going to look like a year from now, but I'm hopeful that we have embraced the idea that this information is useful. We've found ways to organize it and ways to make it more actionable and analyze it so that the community has more opportunities to communicate when networks are down. First responders and neighbors can help one another more effectively. Okay, thank you for that perspective and uh, look forward to seeing you online. Thank you, it was a pleasure.